Hello and welcome to networking part four, obviously part four of my networking series where we're looking at building a very simple massively multiplayer online game. If you've not watched the previous parts of this series and indeed you haven't seen my rectangles versus circles collision video, uh, I suggest that you do go and catch up because this one is carrying on directly where those have left off. And before we get started, I'd just like to briefly address some concerns that have been raised during this series. As with all of the videos on the One Lone Coder channel, my intention is to introduce new topics and interesting things to people that haven't seen it before. And judging by the fantastic feedback that I receive, I think I'm doing a pretty good job. However, if you are of the expectation that a YouTube channel giving out free 40-minute videos here and there is a sufficient resource to equip you, with real-world tools, then I suggest that you recalibrate your expectations. This series approaches networking programming from the perspective of providing enough information that you can have a go yourself and start diving into what is a very deep and thoroughly satisfying topic to learn. And the series has already shown that it is actually quite a complicated thing and there are many traps you can find yourself falling into. Where possible, I am identifying these and along the way I'm providing convenient utilities for people to just get started. Now, this video assumes that you have some sort of working server client networking infrastructure. And we have, we've developed that in the previous episodes. And I'm going to move away from the networking architecture and start to look at the game design using that architecture. And by the end of this video, we'll have developed a very simple client and server application set, which will demonstrate what I believe is the fundamental design philosophy of massively multiplayer online games, passivity. And I'm definitely going to pronounce that incorrectly many times during this video. To understand passivity, to understand passivity, we need to take a little trip through the history of multiplayer games. And what I want us to consider are the several different ways that we partition our programs depending on how many players are involved. Single player games are probably the most simple. And the design philosophy involved is what we've used on most of the videos in this channel. In our game loop, we get the user input, move the player, update the world and game, and draw it all out to the screen. The concept of the player and everything involved with representing the player is fundamental to our program. And it's quite likely that we'll handle all of the player interactions with the world using data directly related to the player. Developers soon realized that playing games together was quite fun. And so a lot of games had two player capability on the same screen. Sometimes the screen could be split in two. In this situation, the game would have a specific two-player mode. So we'd get the input from player one, and then we'd get the input from player two. We would then update the players, update the rest of the game stuff, and draw everything to the screen. If the game is designed to be fair, and therefore both players have the same set of abilities, then it is likely that the game code would reuse the player interaction functions, but on separate player data i.e. somewhere in our code we have a layout that represents what a player is and it might contain information such as position and velocity and health and partitioning our program this way allows us to support a variable number of local players for each player get the input and update this approach works fine when all of your players are sat around the same screen playing using the same program. When it became apparent to developers that most gamers like to sit alone at home, then clearly they couldn't sit at the same hardware using the same program. They needed to have two programs communicating via a network. In the very early days, it used to be quite turn-based, but I couldn't imagine playing a first-person shooter turn-based. It would be quite a stale experience. Typically in a two-player multiplayer game, one of the players would act as a server, and the other would act as a client. And I recall always wanting to be the server because if you weren't the server, then you didn't have the best computer. Regardless, it was still very possible that early programs like these assumed that the players were finite things. So whoever was the server would have been player one and whoever was the client would be player two. And the program would follow a similar pattern. We would get the local input. We would update the player state. We would transmit and receive information about players to our directly connected buddy and we would go on to update the world and draw. As you might expect this is a simplification and there would have been many different ways of implementing two computers directly connected to each other and it wasn't long until this model was expanded to support multiple 
clients, and therefore multiple players. As more clients are added to this network, the server has a lot more work to do. And if the owner of the server was playing, but losing, and decided to rage quit, which I never did obviously, shutting down their application would shut down everything for everybody connected. These days, when we think of so-called massively multiplayer games, what we actually think about is that the server is running the game somewhere, and as a player we connect purely as a client, i.e. no one player has direct control over the game. In such a situation, the server is running and maintaining a game world, and clients connect to that server running the game world and see and interact with a portion of it. The client applications need to be very passive, hence the word passivity. Clients can come and go as they please. They can connect and disconnect to the server, but they mustn't disrupt the ongoing game for the other players. At the same time, as the clients move around the world, the other clients need to be able to see the players moving around. And it's not just players, it's all in-game activity. And I found it useful when developing my multiplayer games to continue the philosophy that no one player is any more important than the others. And we'll take that to the client applications too, which is surprising because you might think that the client application would prioritize the player using that particular client. This requires us to construct our program a little differently. Our clients will receive from the server commands which change the nature of objects within the game, such as other player positions. The client will maintain a container of all of the players. The players in the game, as we've seen in our networking infrastructure so far, have a unique identifier, which is issued by the server. We can use this identifier to update on the client that particular player. Now remember, all the clients connected to the server will be executing the same program. So all the clients have this container of all the players, and the server will issue a player update containing the ID and say some position or velocity information. Each client also knows its own ID. So this one could be 250, this one could be 251, this one could be 252. Since a client does know its ID, we can locally control the player corresponding to that client. We'll get some local user input, update with my ID, and then we can send back to the server the state of our current player. The server will then distribute that state to all of the other clients, who can then update the local models of our player. Once all the player information has been updated, the client can go on to update its local world, which could be full of things like special effects and particles and menus and that sort of thing, and draw. In a way, this is quite similar to the local two-player games at the start but all of the clients maintain the properties for all of the players. Clients are also responsible for locally updating their own player as well as the other players. Naturally, client 250 here doesn't control the player for 252. It can only issue movement updates for the player object with the ID 250. Now, I appreciate this may all seem a little bit complicated, but it does have some considerable benefits. Firstly, the client and the player using the client will feel like everything is very responsive. As they press the keys, their client is controlling their character's position in the world. That position and velocity information is sent to the server, and the server redistributes it back to all of the clients. The clients that have received that player update information can now update the local representations of player 250. But they won't treat these player objects any differently to their own players. So as client 252 is updating client's position 250 in this client's space, the player is subject to all of the collision detection and rules of the world. So those rules are first checked by client 250, all that is sent to the server is some movement information, which is redistributed back out, and then the collisions are also checked locally on all of the clients. This removes any burden from the server to do this. The server can simply relay information. And this gets very fiddly to draw with arrows and diagrams like this. It's actually much easier to see when we start coding it. But fundamentally, the purpose is to keep the server load down, offload as much work as possible to the clients, and keep the user experience per client as snappy and responsive as possible. For example, what we don't want to do is the following. We read some user input from this particular client and we send that user input to the server. The server then does all of the calculations of the player's location in space 
and sends that back out to the clients. This doesn't work because the time taken to send this information to the server might be 50 milliseconds or so there and potentially 70 milliseconds back, who knows? So you have a round trip time, meaning that as the player pressed a key, they're now waiting 120 milliseconds to see any response. That will be a very unsatisfying experience. And so the system I'm proposing will allow the player to feel in control of their environment, but also passively let all of the other players move around in their client environment. That's enough scribbling, let's get started with the code. Now because this is a part 4, I'm going to move with a little bit more pace because I think people at this point will be quite familiar with the very basics. I've created a Visual Studio solution that contains two projects. One is called MMO Client and the other is called MMO Server. As usual, I'm keeping this as simple as possible. So I'll be using as few files as possible. It makes it easier to navigate. The server contains two files. One is mmocommon.h which contains some standard includes which we're going to use in both the server and the client, but also our game message, which if you recall is the enum class type that our framework requires. I've also populated it with some basic things to get us started. The mmoserver.cpp file is currently blank, and the mmoclient.cpp file calls our mmocommon.h header and instantiates a class of the Pixel Game Engine. Nothing new here, and here we can see our int main for the client, it constructs the Pixel Game Engine class. And here we have our onuser update and onuser create functions. Unusually, as well as inheriting from the Pixel Game Engine, I'm also inheriting from our client interface. Oh yes, very scary stuff indeed, isn't it? Multiple inheritance, no, 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 no. Anyway, I'm quite happy with it and not afraid of it. But if you are, you could always go and create a different class that inherits from this and use that class as an object in our MMO game class. The common header file is shared between the client and the server, so anything that we want to be game specific that is shared, we can stick all in one place. It's just very convenient this way, and we can guarantee then that our server and our client are using the same versions of the data structures. And the whole point of what I'm trying to achieve here is that the server will be maintaining the state of some simulation, and the clients will be passively observing a small part of that simulation and were necessary sending information to the other clients to update the local copies of that simulation. The video prior to this one looked at circle versus rectangle collisions and introduced the transformed view pegx. And this is no coincidence because this is exactly the framework I'm going to use to demonstrate the principles of our massively multiplayer game before moving into something that makes it look more game-like. So it's quite important that you've seen this video because I'm going to just bring in the code directly. I'll start by pulling in the transform view extension, creating an instance of it, defining the world map, as you can see, the same as before, and in onuser create, I'm going to create our tile transform view. In onuser update, I'm going to grab the middle mouse button input, clear the screen, and draw all of the tiles in our world. Let's take a very quick look. Looks good. We've got panning and zooming and a tile based world. Our world is going to be populated with player objects, and as in the previous video, I will be representing those as circles. But what is a player in our world? Let's go to the common file. I'm going to create a simple structure called player description. And a player in our world will have a unique identifier. This is defined by the networking framework. It may also have a unique way of looking. So we'll have some identifier that represents the avatar. We might not use all of these today, but we might use them in the next video. Players typically have some properties, so let's have a look. We've got health, ammo, number of kills, number of deaths, and for now we may also have something very simple, like how big is our player in the world. Finally, I'm going to add the player's current position in the world and the player's current velocity, and it's the velocity we will see which is crucial to this video. In the circles versus rectangles collision video, we had one object in our world. So we could manipulate it directly. That would have been similar to the single player game design philosophy I showed earlier. Now however, our player object has no higher priority or no more importance than any other player object in this connected simulation. So we need to choose a suitable container to store all of these player objects. And the container I'm going to choose is unordered map. Unordered map in other languages is known as a hash map where you can provide a key and a value. In this case, the key is an unsigned 32-bit integer. In fact, the key will be the unique identifier of the object in the simulation. 
The object itself is just going to be our player description struct. One of the advantages of using the standard unordered map in this instance is I can easily insert and remove players as they connect and disconnect from the game. I can also quickly access a particular player given its identifier, and because it's a standard container I can iterate over it very quickly. By contrast, containers such as standard list or standard vector, which you would typically see me use, could quite happily hold all of the map objects, and we wouldn't pay much of a penalty for inserting and removing from them, but actually indexing them becomes difficult, because we would have to search every time we wanted to find them. So whereas an unordered map has a little bit of a performance penalty on most of its operations, on the whole, it's the fastest structure we can use to exploit the properties we need. In on user update, we're going to update the state of all of the objects in the game for this client. Now you might think, wow, he's just cut and pasted in a load of stuff. That's actually exactly the same code that we had in the previous video. It's doing the circle rectangle collision detection based on all objects, iterating with a little auto for loop through all of the objects in our unordered map. Likewise, once we've drawn all of the tiles in the world, I'm going to draw all of the objects as circles with the given radius and a line indicating the direction they're currently traveling in just as we did in the previous video. One slight difference here is I'm also going to display the unique identifier alongside each object. The important distinction that I'm trying to really hammer home with this video is notice there is nothing specifically player related for this client. It's all of the objects being updated and all of the objects being drawn. We do need to have some lightweight linkage between this instance of the client and the player object. I'm going to facilitate this linkage through the use of a single variable nplayerID, which again is the unique identifier that will be assigned to this instance of the client. Therefore, we can use this identifier in our unordered map to always find the object that represents the player for this client. Therefore, in onUser update, we know how to now manipulate the player object. I want to use the W, S, A, and D keys as before to control the movement of the player. So I'm going to set the player object's velocity to zero to begin with. And here you can see I'm indexing the unordered map using the player ID. And just as before, I see which keys are being held down and I adjust the velocity accordingly. This will give me that immediate responsive feel because I'm directly manipulating the object client side before I go and update its position in space. The end result is that to the player, there will be zero lag between them pressing the keys and the object moving around in the world. We could really do with testing this setup so far. Normally, we would get objects sent to us from the server. But to test it, we're going to have to create one artificially, because we've not yet connected anything via the network. Unordered maps have this curious property that you can index objects that don't necessarily exist. So right now our map is empty, but just by indexing it like this, I've now created an object with a key of zero and a value of whatever our default player description struct was. So I can immediately set some properties about this player object. I'm just going to simply set our unique ID to zero, because why not? That's what we're using. And I'm also going to set the current position, just so we're not in the very top corner of the map, because that would put us in collision with the tiles. So let's take a look and see if things are working. We can see our map. We can see an object up here represented as the circle with an ID of zero. This all looks very familiar to the previous video. And as I hold down the W, A, S and D keys, I can move the circle around. I can pan and zoom with the mouse and I cannot go through the tiles representing the walls. We've got the collision detection in place. Interestingly, I could go and create another object with some arbitrary large ID in this instance. Let's take a look now. Now we have two objects in our game world, and the player is only in control of one of them. It happens to be the one that matches our nPlayerID variable in the class, which by default was zero. So that's good. Our framework can support the movement and drawing of multiple objects. I've commented this out because now we're going to have to deal with some of the networking side of things. We don't know what our player identifier is going to be until we've connected to the server and the server has issued it to us. Because we've also inherited from the client interface of the networking framework, we can call functions of that interface directly. So here I'm calling the connect function to my local host address on port 60,000, which is where I'm going to put my server. If I can't connect this way, then I want my application to just fail. I'm going to return false from onUserCreate and that'll shut it down. Otherwise, I'm going to return true. 
In a real application, you'll want to handle this more gracefully and let the player know what's happening. But as I say, we're just sticking to the very basics so we can see what the flow of things are through this development. Assuming we've successfully connected to the server, we'll then start to loop calling on user update. Standard pixel game engine behavior. But we need to be sensitive to the server sending us information. So we can do this by polling our incoming message queue. Firstly, let's make sure and double check that we're still connected. We can access the incoming message queue directly with the incoming function. And if it's not empty, that means there are messages for us to process. Let's grab the message at the front of the queue, which will also remove it from the queue. And then based on the messages header identifier, we'll do some action. As we progress with this, we may need to put a limit on the number of messages we process any particular frame. But for now, I'm just going to try and empty the queue as quickly as I can, because I'm going to assume that my frame update is going to be much faster than the network speed. Going back to the common header file, we can see we've got four interesting messages here related to the client. The first will be sent by the server. It's client accepted. That says you've been successfully connected to the server and you've been allowed to communicate with it. Because don't forget our server interface can reject clients. The second is a command from the server to assign this particular client with a unique identifier. That one's obviously quite important to us. This third one is register with server. And it in fact is this message that we'll need to send to the server once we've been accepted in order for the server to respond with our identifier. Finally, we have unregister with server, which we're not going to use in this video, but it will allow us to gracefully disconnect from a server. Since there is scope for the server not accepting our connection, I'm going to add a Boolean to our world, waiting for connection. If this Boolean is equal to true, then I'm simply going to display a blue screen and the phrase waiting to connect to the player. It may take a bit of time for the server to accept our connection and do the negotiating handshakes with us. During that time, I don't want the application to freeze, but I also don't want it to start displaying the game world. That could be very confusing. It could also lead to crashes because the game world is represented from the perspective of the client, but the client doesn't exist yet. So by putting a little lock here, this is effectively turning our on user update function into a bit of a lobby. We're going to wait until we're given permission to continue. So. We've attempted to connect to the server. If that hasn't failed, then we've started our on user update loop, at which point we're now waiting for the server to accept our connection. Since we're debugging this, I'm going to put in a little message so we can see, and we'll only have received this message if the server is happy for us to continue talking to it, at which point we want to send it another message. So I'll create the message object, set the identifier to register with server, and then send that message. But what exactly is the information I'm registering with the server? I'm simply going to send it a player description object. The player description object could contain information such as the player's name, and it contains our avatar ID and other properties related to our player. We're expecting the server to set the unique identifier for us. As we're still developing this application, it's quite convenient to have the stream operator overloads for our message type. I'm going to initialize the player's position to 3-3 in the top left corner, and then I'm going to shove that structure into our message object, and that's what I'm going to send to the server. If all goes well and the server now accepts our registration, it's going to send us our unique identifier. We can simply extract that out of the message that's been popped off the incoming queue, and I'm also going to display it to the console. We now know how to access our unordered map, but it's all very well knowing how to access our unordered map. Our unordered map doesn't contain anything. Let's go back to the common file and look at the other commands. We now have game specific messages. Game add player indicates that a player has entered the game simulation. Likewise, game remove player indicates the player has left the simulation and game update player will contain any changes to the player's current state. The unordered map for this particular client is empty and it will only be populated when the server sends game add player messages. In principle, when the client connects to the server, the server is going to have to send to this client all of the players that are currently in the game world. So it'll send quite a few of these messages and one at a time will build up the player objects in our unordered map. So we need to parse the player description out of our message object and then insert it into our unordered map using the unique identifier as the key and the description as the object. 
At this point, we can also check to see if the player for this client has been added to the game world. Yes, we've been assigned an identifier, but we've not been told by the server that our client's avatar is actually in this simulation. So we can check that the unique identifier of the description is equal to our player's unique identifier. And if it is, well, now we exist in the world, we are no longer waiting for the connection, the game can begin as normal. The server can also indicate that players have left the simulation. So if we receive a game remove player message, then we look at the identifier of the player to remove, we pull that out of our message, and we simply erase it from our unordered map. This is quite nice because it means that our unordered map container will only contain valid game objects. Notice we're not using pointers anywhere here. Finally, the server had the ability to update a player's status. Now, because we're trying to emphasize passivity, it's not the status of this particular client's player, it's the status of any particular player. So when we receive the update player message, and we'll receive quite a few of these, we look at the description, and just as we did with the add player function, we do insert or assign to our unordered map. Insert or assign is a little bit different because it checks to see, well, does this particular unique identifier already exist? If it does, then just overwrite what's there. This may seem like an unnecessary duplication of functionality, but later on we'll see that actually we don't really need to send the whole player description each time. We only want to send a portion of it, but that's for a future video. Rather strangely, we've almost finished the entirety of the client code for now. There's one last thing to do, however. At the end of our game loop, we need to send back to the server the status of our current player. So I'm going to create the message, set the identifier to game update player. This one is going out to the server, push into our message object the player description using our unique player identifier and send it. The server will receive this and then distribute it to all of the other clients. Our player description object contained information relating to the position and velocity of an object. We've already seen quite a few times now that locally on the client, as we move the object to the screen, it's doing collision detection with its environment. We now also know that the server will have added to our client environment other objects that represent the other players. Those two will have position and velocity properties. Locally to the client, collision detection occurs on the player object. So once we've collided with this wall, we know we're only going to be transmitting legitimate positions to the server, and that the player experience for themselves will be a legitimate one. From this client's perspective, we're getting periodic events representing the motion of the other players. However, this will not be as consistent as our own motion, because there's a great big network in the way. What we receive instead is a set of packets which represent a position and a velocity. Locally, the client is also simulating the movement of these remote players. So it's very possible that we could get a velocity that would place the player in collision with the wall, even though the remote player's client has stopped that collision happening for them. This is why I'm also choosing to do collision detection locally for the remote players. It doesn't affect the collision, of course, but graphically it looks right from the client's perspective. So this client is responsible for generating an accurate local simulation for this remote player. And if all of the clients connected to our system behave this way, they will all look right from the perspective of the player. There are some additional complexities to this, which we will get into into the next video, particularly if different clients are running at considerably different speeds. But you'll be surprised just how convincing this technique can be. It's now time to look at the server. Unfortunately, our server is quite a simple application. The server too is also going to maintain an unordered map of objects, and it too will also include the MMO common file. However, unlike the client, our server is not going to be a client of the Pixel game engine. Instead, it inherits just from the server interface. We do have to, however, provide some overrides for some functions. So the first would be on client connect, and right now I'm going to allow all clients to connect. Connection occurred at the physical address level, if you remember, so that's a chance to uh, blacklist particular IP addresses. We had a second, very basic and crude security mechanism, which allowed us to validate that the client was at least capable of talking to us sensibly. 
and we'll also need to handle a client being disconnected. And we'll come back to that later. The most important function to override is onMessage, which allows us to respond to events being sent from clients to server. Our game server class is just floating on its own at the moment, so we need to give it an int main. We'll create an instance of our server, tell it to listen on port 60,000, and we'll get it to start. I'm then going to sit in a tight while loop, asking the server to update itself. Now, this won't consume a full CPU core because we've got that blocking on our queue, which means the server effectively goes to sleep until something wakes it up. Well, just like we did with the clients, we need to sort out what happens when these messages arrive. We know that the first thing a client may try to do is register with the server. After all, if it's got this far, it's been validated and connected. And just like the client, our server is going to maintain an unordered map of unique identifiers and player description. This is going to be called the player roster. When a player sends the register with server message, it sends a player description describing that client. The server will populate the unique identifier property of that description and then add it to the roster. The server is now aware of what the unique identifier is for that particular client. So it needs to respond to that client by sending it the assign ID message. So here I create the message, shove in the identifier and use our message client function to send it directly back. At this point, we can also assume that the client needs to be added to the game world. And all of the clients need to be informed that that has happened. So I'll create another message with the identifier add player, and that message also took the player description as its data. And I'll send that to all of the clients, including the client that's just connected. Because just briefly looking at the client code, recall that the player doesn't exist until it has been added to the game world. So all the clients will go away and add a new object to the map of objects. It's all very well sending the new client to all of the existing clients. We now need to send all of the existing clients to the new client. And this is very simple. We'll just create a little auto for loop, which goes through the server's player roster, creates a unique message to add the other players to the client's object map, and we'll send that to the client directly. Interestingly, both this message and this message will send the add player message to the client for the client itself. But that's okay because we're using this map objects insert or assign. So if it already exists, it just gets overwritten. So register with server is quite a heavy function. Fortunately, this doesn't happen too often. For completeness, I'm just going to throw in the unregister with server 2, but I'm leaving that blank for this video. And finally for our server, I want to handle the update player. So the client will send an update of its current status. All the server needs to do is simply bounce this message back out to all of the other clients, except the one that sent it. At this point, the server could also update its player roster, and we'll see that in the next video. So let's take a look. I'm going to build our server and build our client. And recall that it's a bit tricky from uh, Visual Studio to launch these things uh, simultaneously. So I'm going to go to the debug folder, which is where the executables are now placed. And I'm going to start the server. Server started. I'm now going to start the client. Well, start one of them. They're quite big. We may need to make these smaller. But we can see in the clients box that the server accepted the client and assigned me the ID, well, 10,000. So if we go and have a look and zoom in on our player here, we can see we've got ID 10,000, and I can move around. So let's put that client there, and let's start another client up as well. Well, encouragingly, we can see we've got two clients in the game world, and we've got two clients in this game world too. So I'm going to move those so we can see both screens at the same time, and I'll move around in my original world. There we go, and we can see that the client moves around in both. Just have a quick look at the server output. So yes, we got the two new connections and they were validated, that's fine. And if I focus on the other client, I can move it around too. These windows are all a little unwieldy, so I'm just going to make them a bit smaller. In the client, I'm going to set these to be one by one pixel and we'll use uh, 480 by 480. We'll create little square windows. Launch the server and launch the client. That's a bit better, there we go. So that's one client. Let's launch a few more. Three. Four. Four clients. I'll space these out. Well, it looks like we've only got two, but of course the clients have all started in the same position. As I change the focus of each window, I'm controlling a different client. What's nice is in this top left one, which I'm now in control of, 
uh, it feels incredibly responsive. And it should do. It's local host, and we'll come back to that in a bit. But my collision detection is accurate, but it's also really accurate for all of the other clients too. And that's because this particular client is doing local collision detection for itself, but also doing collision detection for the remote players. So should the messages lag and the velocity forces the player object into a wall, we don't perceive it. There's only one slight problem at the moment, and that's when players leave. They don't seem to leave the game world. And this problem is made a little bit more tricky by the fact that we don't know if a client has disconnected until we try to communicate with the client. Sure, a gracefully terminating client will send a message saying, hey look, I'm done, I've had enough, here you go, thanks a lot, goodbye. But that's rarely the case. More often than not, it just goes away, it just disappears. Now, we know we can detect that when we attempt to message the client, because it's that detection which fundamentally we'll call this on client disconnect function in our server interface. So it makes sense that on this function, I then go and message all of the other clients to remove the identifier related to that client connection object. The only problem here, and maybe this is a, an area of design which could significantly be improved, is I can't actually message clients in this function. This function is called as a result of messaging the clients. So I'm effectively causing a recursion to occur because the original message client function will try and message a client that's disconnected and fail, which will call this on client disconnect function. And if we're here, we then attempt to message the clients again. Well, the client is still disconnected, so it'll fail and so on and so on. To deal with this problem, I'm going to add a very simple garbage collector. I'm going to create a standard vector of our unique identifiers called V garbage IDs. And when a client actually is disconnected, the first thing I'm going to check for is does that client's identifier actually exist in our player roster? During networking, all sorts of things happen. We could have had failures during connect. We could have had failures before validation. That means the client technically exists, but we've not sort of absorbed it into the game world. So that's a check for that. If it's not in the player roster, we honestly don't care anymore, so just don't do anything. However, if the player is in our player roster, I'm going to display a quick message to the terminal, I'm going to erase the player from the roster, and I'm going to add that identifier to my vector of garbage IDs. In my on message function, and assuming that we're going to be getting lots of messages all the time, I'm going to make a check to see do I have any garbage IDs, and if I do, then for each garbage ID I'm going to send the remove player message to all of the clients. So let's build that server again and open some clients. Here I've opened up six clients and we can see six clients existing in the game world and as I select each particular client I can move around the agent that represents that client and it moves across all of the different game worlds. Very nice. I'm going to close down this top right client now and we can see that that client has been removed from all of the other clients game worlds. That's because the clients received the remove player event from the world. In effect, our client application is now a very passive window into the ongoing simulation. Clients can come and go as they please. Clients can send data and the server is bouncing that data to all of the other clients quite happily. Now we've got a way of happily moving objects around our game world we need to think of a way for them to interact with each other. And that will be the topic of the next video in this series, which may not be the next video on this channel. We're going to look at how can the players shoot each other accurately. If you've enjoyed this video, a big thumbs up, please. Have a think about subscribing. Come and have a chat on the Discord. Uh, there will be a source code update on the GitHub for all of this. And uh, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.